So they say that you should dress for the job that you want. And I would like to be a saint in the government of Jesus Christ, the great King. And one of the perks of being uh, in his government is that from time to time, during uh, functions, you get to wear a cape. And uh, that's always a good thing. The only inaccuracies with this costume today is that if I were a real saint, uh, the wrinkles would be gone and, uh, and I'd probably have white cowboy boots. All right, so we're going to have a, have a bit of fun with this today. Um, after the class, up here at the front, it looks like a giant fancy birthday cake, but it's actually a, a diorama I've done of Israel. So come up and take a look at that um, after the class or, or whenever you get free time. What we want to do, um, so with the, the green pencils, with the kids, uh, we have a color system in our Bibles and we go through and color things to help them stand out. Now, color for the kingdom and for the saints is green. And uh, so it's fun when you do the, do the daily readings or open up your Bible anytime. When you see something about the kingdom, to color it in green. And uh, you'll see here, this is Isaiah 2. We're all pretty familiar with that. Lots of green in there, lots of kingdom stuff. So my question to start is, has anybody ever been up to the third Jewish temple? Raise your hand if you have. I, I go up there all the time. It's the most beautiful place, right? Of course, I'm, I'm going up in my imagination, but I go up there all the time and I look around and I open doors and see what's behind them. And uh, I just have a great time up there. And so, what we want to do is we want to create a vision of the kingdom for ourselves and disclaimer right now your vision might be quite a bit different than mine and that's fine um, but we we have to create that vision here in uh, Acts chapter 5 we have the disciples who would get beat up by the Pharisees and they would just cup it on the chin spit the blood out and uh, and just be so happy that they were part of the Lord's team and they had this vision for the future, didn't they, that would get them through those tough times. And of course, Jesus Christ himself, uh, for the joy set before him, endured the cross and the shame and all the things that went with it, because he had in his head this wonderful vision of the kingdom that kept him going. So as Christadelphians, we're quite lucky, aren't we, that we, can, we have um, quite a bit of information in the scriptures as to what this kingdom's gonna be like. When we ask our Christian friends what it's like in heaven, um, generally you'll get this, uh, that you're gonna be sitting on a cloud and playing a harp. And this is a little idol you can buy at Walmart, by the way, for about $36. Um, but but we're, we're more fortunate, aren't we? Because when we look through the scriptures, we will find an absolute mountain of information. We have so much information in the scriptures on the kingdom that we can talk about how many slaying blocks there are on the northern side of the temple, um, how tall or how wide the gateways are, all sorts of amazing things, clues that we have in the scriptures for us. So I wanna put it forward to you that the kingdom, uh, we actually have a template for the kingdom. If we wanna know what the kingdom's gonna be like, a good place to go is to the record of Solomon. And I put it to you that Solomon is actually uh, the template for the kingdom. So it says here, Behold, a son shall be born to thee, who shall be a man of rest, and I'll give him a rest from all his enemies round about. His name shall be Solomon, and I'll give him peace and quietness unto Israel in his days. And that's a picture of Solomon, if you were wondering. And of course, it ties in perfectly with the Lord Jesus Christ. When we go through first principles in 2 Samuel 7, the third covenant, the covenant to David, um, it's very similar to language that we get for Solomon in uh, 1 Chronicles 22. So we know that Jesus is, a, is sort of the greater fulfillment of those covenant promises. So he, we know with Jesus it says, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So we know that the kingdom is going to be uh, a time of rest. So then we would have to sort of think about well, what that rest might look like and what, what is rest. 
In Solomon's empire, the, the dark red there is what it was like before David took over, and then the orange is David when it, uh, spent a lot of time shedding blood, and that's why he couldn't build the temple. And so he spread that empire into the orange section, and then under Solomon, economically, it sort of spread even further. When we open up our, our Bibles to Second Chronicles uh, chapter 1, it tells us some things about this, king, about this um, kingdom that Solomon had. And so it says, The king made silver and gold at Jerusalem as plenteous as stones, and cedar trees made he as the sycamore trees that are in the vale for abundance. And Solomon had horses brought out of Egypt and linen yarn, and the king's merchants received the linen yarn at a price. And so we have these um, sort of big, big things happening. The, there's so much gold and silver that it's like stones. We're planting trees um, and we're trading with the other nations. In 1 Kings 4, 20, it says uh, that, that all Judah and Israel were eating and drinking and being merry. So that sounds like fun, right? They're, they're having a great time. It says in, in the verse 24 that there was peace on all sides around about him that they were dwelling safely in verse 25, and every man was under his own vine and fig tree. There were 4,000 horse stalls and 12,000 horsemen. And in Kings, it says 40,000 horse stalls, but it later uh, throws out the number 4,000. So I'm not sure which is, which is right. In verse 27, they lacked for nothing. So this sounds like a great time, and certainly the pinnacle of, of the time in Israel, 1 Kings 4.31 says, Solomon was wiser than all men, famous in all surrounding nations. And we know that the Lord Jesus Christ is wiser than Solomon, right? We have uh, the record that Solomon wrote 3,000 proverbs and 1,005 songs. And that's something that you certainly can't do unless it's time of peace. You need to be able to put your feet up and uh, really relax and, and meditate in order to get that done. Verse 33 talks about scientific knowledge, and I can imagine Solomon going out and sort of looking at the plants and looking at the animals, and that really comes through in the Proverbs, doesn't it? The kings of the earth come to hear him, and we're going to totally see this with the Lord Jesus, aren't we? And the, the fun thing is to go through the scripture and look at the references for the kingdom and match them up with what you see happening with Solomon, and they're all there. 1 Kings 5, 10 and 11, there's this big trade deal with his neighbor. And of course, this is in complete contrast, isn't it, to uh, the wars and stuff that we see come along later under the kings. And so just a, a wonderful time where you're not at war with your neighbors, but you're, you're making uh, trade deals and everybody's benefiting and having a great time. So in verse 13, we have this huge national employment drive. Uh, I've got New Deal in brackets there. And it even goes so far as to tell us that what he would do is he would send all these people up north because that's where all the trees were back then. There's no trees there now, but back in the day, up in Syria, full of these beautiful cedars that were going to get um, chopped down to build the temple. Uh, he would send all these people up and they would work for a month, but then they would get two months off. And so I think that's a little hint perhaps at the kingdom. And we think, because we know that there's got to be a lot of work to be done. There's just in building the temple itself is a, is a major, major thing. Um, so people will be working hard. We've got to rebuild the whole world, but it's not going to be like in America where you have to work for an entire year to get one week off. And uh, that was a struggle for me coming here from Australia where I had six weeks vacation the day I started a job. So we work pretty hard here in America. It's going to be much easier than it is here. First Kings 8, 42 through 44. Uh, the repentant Gentiles are blessed by God. God gives his people rest. And all the earth uh, know the Lord is God. And that's something that we really look forward to. It's going to take a lot of work to, to make that a reality. First Kings 9, cities are gifted to trade partner um, Hiram. And there's lots of city building. And one thing I think we'll see in the kingdom is that when the economies are decimated and stuff, uh, as we change over from the kingdoms of men to the kingdom of God, 
that uh, people are going to be lost and everything's going to be seem like it's at an end but but they'll go up to jerusalem they'll know there's employment there there's lots of work to be done to build this temple and that's the first sort of um you know jesus says it starts out like a mustard seed and grows but so so that's going to be the first thing people are going to go up there and help to build the temple and there's lots of quotes for that um aliens of combat become servants over in first chronicles 22 it, david uh, makes a statement where you know he spent his life fighting all these wars and extending the territories and pushing out the enemies and uh, as he did that he would collect a whole lot of um, uh, treasure along the way and so he says to solomon i put this aside for you for the temple and in first chronicles 22 14 he says a hundred thousand talents of gold so a talent uh, apparently is 75 pounds so that'd be 3,400 metric tons of gold, which as of a few weeks ago would be $300 billion. And then a million talents of silver, 34,000 metric tons at uh, today's value of 33.6 billion. Now, when we look at Jeff Bezos, uh, and he and Musk sort of swap positions as to who's the richest, but uh, last I looked, he, he had a net worth of 201 billion. Well, Solomon, when you Google him, and it's, it's a little tricky to get accurate numbers, obviously, so all they can do is estimate, but um, his net worth comes in at 2.1 trillion. So he would be in the top sort of five to 10, depending on how you, how you measure it up, of all the human beings that ever walked on, on the face of the earth for, for riches. So, uh, and of course, we know that this is gonna be, you know, Jesus is gonna be the king of the world and all these riches will be under his control. So um, that uh, cube there is if you got all the gold that's in the world that's ever been mined and all the stuff that we have today and put it into a big cube, that's how big it would be. So bigger than, you know, about the size of a, a bit bigger than a house, $15 trillion worth at today's prices. So the forces of the Gentiles shall come unto thee, the multitude of camels shall cover thee, the dromedaries of Midian and Ephah, all they from Sheba shall come, they shall bring gold and incense. The ships of Tarshish will bring the Jews home and they'll bring silver and gold with them. So this is all gonna be amassed up in the region of Zion after the return of Christ. For brass I will bring gold, and for iron I will bring silver, and for wood, brass, and for stones, iron. So God's telling us that I'm just going to go all out with this. This is, you know, Zion has to be the most beautiful place in the world, and I'm going to make it that way. When we look at Solomon and his template and what he did with, with his, the temple that he, that he built, all that gold that David had, had stored up for him uh, to be used is is recorded in first kings chapter 6 and it is everywhere in verse 20 it says um, the oracle in the fore part overlaid it with pure gold verse 21 solomon overlaid the house within with pure gold so the inside of the house is completely covered the whole house in verse 22 overlaid with gold the altar that was by the oracle overlaid with gold and he overlaid the cherubims with gold in verse 28 and verse 30. And the floor of the house he overlaid with gold within and without. So imagine that. Even the floor of Solomon's temple is overlaid with gold. God just goes all out with this place. Now, if that's Solomon's temple, what's the great temple, the third Jewish temple, the temple in Zion going to be like? That's the template for it, though. So I've been in the, in the truth for 20 something years and uh, it's always been told to me that the kingdom's gonna be agrarian, that uh, basically we're gonna be like the Amish for a thousand years. And um, there's certainly gonna be a lot of agrarian stuff going on, no doubt about it. We've got lots and lots of quotes saying how the, how the ground's gonna bring forth abundantly. You can get a, a handful of corn off, off a high mountain. Um, so there will be that, but what, what I want to put forth to you is that it's going to be so much more than that as well. There was a brother who, who his thing was the kingdom and, and he would give talks and say that if you want to 
make, make a lot of money, you need to invest in the olive oil industry because everything in the kingdom will run on olive oil. And uh, I don't quite see it that way. So in our modern lives with air conditioning and um, GPS and all the, all the gadgets that we have, we kind of have this romance about what agrarian life would be like. And essentially uh, what, what well, the way that we look at it is that we're going to be self-sustaining and we're going to do everything ourselves. So that sounds great to be able to not need to go to Walmart or to, to the store for groceries. But when you sit down and think about what that actually means, that means that you're up at the crack of dawn, you've got to go and collect the eggs out of the hen house, you've got to go milk the cow, you've got to start gathering wood, uh, you've got to start kneading the dough, and it goes on and on and on and on. And you spend your whole day just getting by with the basics. This, uh, so Stephanie and I, about once a year, we watched this whole series called Frontier House. And what they did, they got three families from different parts of the United States, and they sent them up to Montana and they said, all right, you're up here, you're gonna to pretend to be uh, a settler in the frontier in 1886-ish. So you gotta build a cabin and try and live. And so at the end of uh, six months, we're gonna see if you would have had enough stored up to get through the winter because two out of three of them failed and there was a lot of people died up there because they weren't ready. So this is just a short clip, just to, just to give you an idea of what uh, the romance of agrarian life might actually be like. It's just so many different levels of, of it being hard. It's hard because of dirt. Can you hear that? My breath right now is atrocious. I always feel greasy. Like, I almost feel like I've got a ring of zits all around my hairline. So it's this. It's this part. I just feel stinky, reeky, greasy. And there's no way to get cute. Like, I love being able to, if you feel nasty for three or four days at home, you just freshen up, put some eyeliner on, and you feel cute. And it stinks. Even when I wash it, it's never clean. It has, it's not the grease that's dirty, it's the um, soap residue that never comes out. You want to explain to me exactly what's fun about your hands cracking and bleeding while you're holding on to a, a, a tool swinging it through a bunch of tall hay or swinging it through grass? This is just so physically demanding. Um, I don't even know any work to compare to this now. Instead, they trade with the Brooks, who bring a valuable supply of chopped fire. Like quickly. Look at that for a trailer load. Adrian, you'll need us wood no more. Um, say, yeah. An eight-year-old Logan has also been given daily chores. Most importantly, caring for the livestock and hauling water, responsibilities he never had in modern life. Work took over. My only friend here is work. You met him yet? No. Y'all are 21st century lifers. A visitor to the West in the 1870s was shocked to report that childhood was nearly extinct on the frontier. Children as young as three were put to work. Every hand was needed for a homestead to succeed. One out of every five children didn't survive infancy due to disease, and a mother dying in childbirth was tragically common. Men are so much less complicated than women. Women want, they want more than just shelter and food. They want something to look forward to. They want to be entertained. They want a break from the monotony. In five months, I've only had probably about three or four meals that somebody else prepared. All the rest I've done. It's almost like I was transported to a labor camp for five months. I have experienced depression here on the frontier. I've never been depressed before in my life. I never had to deal with that before. And here, I've probably been depressed easily three times a month for a day or two, where I felt like all I wanted to do was go back to bed and cry. Walking out of here, I think I'm gonna have a big smile on my face that you've ever seen. Be like, freedom. <laughs> So, uh, 
that woman at the end there sums it up so much. She says, she says it's like being transported to a labor camp for five months. And, and that's the reality when you try to do everything yourself. And funnily enough, the scriptures tell us that we should actually cooperate with each other and uh, be nice to each other. And so what, what will naturally happen is nobody wants to do all the work themselves. And so, so very quickly, somebody will say, hey, listen, I'm going to be the chicken expert and I'm going to be the, the dairy expert and I'm going to be a blacksmith. And suddenly you get division of labor and, and everybody's standard of living uh, increases quite quickly. I think it's going to be probably be pretty rough at the beginning, but it'll, it'll get better quite quickly. Um, so where do we get this idea of, of this agrarian society? Well, it sort of always comes back to this quote, but they shall sit every man under his vine and under his fig tree, and none shall make them afraid, for the Lord of hosts has spoken it in Micah 4, verse 4. And so there's this idea of, well, everybody's out farming and sitting under trees. But if we read this verse here in Isaiah 65, 21, it says, and they shall build houses and inhabit them and they shall plant vineyards and eat the fruit of them. They shall not build and another inhabit and they shall not plant and another eat. My elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands. And so when you think about the history of Israel, particularly as we go past Solomon into the Kings, they were constantly being uh, attacked by their neighbors and their vineyards were being taken and they were being slaughtered and all these things um, that came upon them. And so the idea of being able to sit peacefully on your own property and not be harassed by evil neighbors is kind of the picture that's painted here for me when I think about it. When you look at that picture there um, and you think about vineyards, if, if, if you, you know, who in our society has vineyards? Are they poor people or are they rich people? right? They're, they're the, the wealthy because, um, and so again, that verse, I think, points to this time of peace and prosperity. If you're still not a believer, then I have one word, dentistry. <laughs> I need some music. Dun, dun, dun. Um, all right, so evil electricity, that's the other thing I've heard. No electricity anymore. We're going back to like Amish ways, right? So Brother Roberts wrote this fantastic little short story with, that he called The Final Consolation in which he describes what he imagined the kingdom to be like. And so here's a passage out of it where he says, we hasten in a straight line along our nine mile avenue of picturesque and happy human habitation. He's down in Yahweh Shema, which we're gonna learn about in a minute. He says, we could take the help of an electric tram if we liked, for such has been provided in all the thoroughfares for use of the people. And so electricity was a new thing uh, for Brother Roberts in the end of the 19th century. And he thought, well, this is great. We've got to have this in the kingdom. It's going to be fantastic. And he later goes on to talk about lights lighting up the houses, electric lights and so forth. So it is, it is just kind of a funny side note how Christadelphians have shunned away from, from the idea of um, some of these comforts that we have today. When we, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna pivot here now and I, I want us to think about just how diverse God is. It, it's really mind blowing. You, you think about it, any one of us would have been happy had God created the earth and given us five different trees and uh, five different types of fish and uh, five different vegetables. I, I think we'd have been fine with that. We wouldn't have known any better and, and life would go on and we'd be happy. But, but let's look at our God and see what he's really like. So of course, he's one of the biggest evolutionists there are out there, but he can see how incredible it is. He doesn't give any glory to God, um, but, but we can see it, right? You see those flowers opening up and you're like, wow, you, know, you can see God just in that one flower. All right, and so human beings have been created in the image of God, and there's no doubt whatsoever that human beings are very creative as well. It makes sense. We like God, and so we like to create things. But we look in the scriptures, and, and it sort of says, thou shalt not be creative, right? You can't make images. You can't uh, draw pictures of things. And yet we do see them in the scriptures, in places like um, Solomon's 
palace here where he had the 12 lions, their images. So what's the difference? How is it that um, it's okay there but not anywhere else? Well, the simple answer is that Israel just couldn't help themselves. Anytime they made something, they'd turn around and worship it. But when you, when you give the glory to God, it's fine. And so in the kingdom, we know that in, in the later pages of uh, Ezekiel, when he's talking about the temple, that we have these images of a man on one side and a lion on the other, and there's hundreds of those um, around the inner temple. So I put it to you that God has made us creative just like him. And it's up to us to use that creativity um, under the, under the, under the um, direction of the great king, use that creativity to glorify God. Think about Numbers 14, 21. At the end of this thousand year period, God's going to come down. There's no more sin and flesh on the earth. And uh, it's almost like Jesus is going to take him on this little tour around the earth and say, hey, dad, look what we did. Look what we did with the place. And God's going to say, wow, that's so great. It just really glorifies me. And so when we're done with the planet at the end of the thousand years, it needs to be spectacular, all, all done to glorify God. And so I think we're going to see the most beautiful, um, you know, sort of creativity come from man. Now, it's almost like a new renaissance. And I've got a warning up there because... Those of you that know history would know that uh, the Renaissance is sort of involved with in humanism and uh, sort of glorifying man. That's true, but when you look, Stephanie and I went to the art museum a couple months ago, and we go through the section in the art museum from, from the Renaissance, and it's just spectacular. You look at these paintings and you're like, wow, human beings can do this. And then you go to the modern art section and you're like, whoa, what happened to us? <laughs> so, so I kind of look at the Renaissance as, as a bit of a pinnacle of, of what human beings can do and create. And so we have you know, the beautiful paintings there. We've got the printing press. This building here, they, they went to so much trouble to figure out all the correct ratios. You'll see there that the, the arches are bigger than the windows above it and the little windows are smaller above it and they have perspective and certain measurements for the columns, and it's all figured out, and there's a lot of thought going into it, which we don't see in our world today. And so beautiful architecture, beautiful art. Um, up in the middle there is the, the Fibonacci rule, which can be brought into the creation. And so when we think about the Renaissance, and then maybe compare it to what we're gonna go into in the kingdom, they kind of line up in a, in a way. So. It's, they came out of a time of trouble, right? The dark ages. And we're coming, uh, when we go into the kingdom of God, we're gonna be moving out of a time of trouble and a, and a time of darkness where nobody gave any glory to God. Ancient ideas are rediscovered. And what was happening was the church had a lot of this information buried away and they dug through and found it. And they found these ratios from the Greeks and the Romans and all this. And so they, they went to work with it. And we're gonna be rubbing shoulders, aren't we, with people from, 4,000, 5,000, 6,000 years ago, and all the knowledge and all the, all the wisdom that they've gathered along the way, um, we're going to incorporate into the world that we create. The church promoted the arts. Now, when I'm talking about the church, it's like the Catholic church, but in the kingdom, Jesus himself uh, is going to promote the arts. He's going to want to beautify the planet. And so painters and sculptors and, and architects are actually going to be uh, appreciated members of society. Right now, they're, they're not. Um, it, it became the epicenter of the exchange of ideas in Florence, Italy, and so people were traveling through and, and exchanging ideas and uh, a crossroads of the civilizations. And so we're going to see that too with Jerusalem being in the middle of the earth in that regard. And so I think we're going to see this beautiful new Renaissance um, era blossom under the leadership of the Lord Jesus. So here's, here's something. The, now, ideas cannot be erased. And I don't think we always think about this with the kingdom. So we're going to have the saints, obviously, who are immortal, will be ruling over mortal subjects. Well, where are we going to get these mortal subjects from? They're the people that you, they're your neighbors. They're the people you go to work with, right? So they're 
people that live right now uh, on the planet Earth in the 21st century. And when you look at the cross-section of those people, you have um, doctors and, and soldiers and airline pilots and, and uh, firefighters and nurses and doctors. I think I said doctors twice. But all these people are going to go into the kingdom age as mortal people, assuming they survive the great uh, upheaval that's going to come on the earth, and they're going to have all, the, all their knowledge in their heads. Now, I can tell you, working in aviation, that with what I have in my head, I could restart the aviation industry uh, the, just with what's in my head. And I'm sure somebody that's in medicine could almost restart that, and so on and so forth. Uh, Jacob Larson, is he here? Where's Jacob today? Anyway, electrician, right? So he's going to get the lights on pretty quick with, with the knowledge that he has. And you can't get rid of this. We're, this is our starting point. When we start day one in the kingdom of God, you've got electricians and, and all the people that I just listed. All right, and let's uh, be a bit interactive here. Let's... Uh, See, who's the first guy on the left, top? Next one? Next one? Mozart? Come down here. All right, we'll skip him. Von Braun, the rocket guy. Da Vinci, all right, let's see how you went. Michelangelo. Right? Okay, good job. So anyway, these guys are pretty smart people throughout history. And you think, um, I don't know how old they were when they died. Um, man lives three score and ten, so within that range. What would, uh, what would they have done had they been able to live for two or three or four hundred years? You ever think about that? And in the kingdom age, are our mortal population going to be healthier and uh, perhaps better educated than they are now? I would say so. So you've got people like, like these guys during the thousand year reign of Christ living for, for hundreds of years. Um, it's pretty hard to say to, to uh, an Einstein, hey, you just got to stay on that plow and keep going back and forth down that field. All right. So there's going to be big changes to the land of Israel, right? We're, we all know that, Zechariah 14 earthquake. This is uh, some Hollywood stuff. So you guys are in for a treat today. What, we, what we've got here is a perspective. Uh, Jerusalem sort of there in the middle, and we're sort of up near Mount Nebo. So on the north eastern side of Israel, looking back towards the Med and the Dead Sea. You got that? All right. Big earthquake. <coughs> Mountains are rising. Everywhere the water goes, turns to life. Dead Sea's filling up with this fresh water. All right. So that's going to happen in the not too distant future. All right. So everything's got to be lifted up. Most of you are aware that the Dead Sea is 1,300 feet below sea level. It's the lowest point in the whole planet. And then as you go back up the Jordan Valley, you get to the Sea of Galilee where Jesus spent all his time. Um, that's still 600 feet below sea level. And that whole Jordan Valley is depressed and, and under. And God actually did that to teach us a lesson that up at the headwaters there was where Pan was and Caesarea Philippi and it was... Uh, this place of apostasy, and the water comes down, it goes down, 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 until you end up in the Dead Sea. And Jesus is going to turn around 
and reverse that whole thing and bring it all back to life. Um, so anyway, what, what does this mean? Well, we'll talk about it again, but the, the marshy places that are at the southern end of the Dead Sea, uh, it's all salty down there, obviously, they have to be preserved. So if we fill that valley up with water, the only way we can preserve the salt there is to lift the salt up. And most, most um, Christadelphians believe that the water may run out of the Dead Sea and back into the Mediterranean. So if that happens, then it has, the sea level has to be at least, sorry, the water level of the Dead Sea has to be the same as the, as the Mediterranean. So that would mean that the salty portion has to be raised 1,300 feet in order to preserve it. And the biggest earthquakes we have on record are, I don't know, 20 meters, what, 60 feet maybe. And that's nine point somethings that destroy everything. So obviously, um, potential there for, for huge, huge changes all around the earth, potentially. So how high would Jerusalem be? Well, Jerusalem's 2,500 feet right now. So if you add another, say, 1,500 feet to that, that takes it up to 4,000 feet. Um, now, there's lots and lots of passages that talk about Zion being the tops of the mountain, so in all the land, that's going to be the highest mountain. So how high would it be? Well, there is a limit. So Steph and I used to live in Colorado, and when I first was dating Steph and came to Colorado, I was in good shape. I was in my 20s, and uh, to show off, I thought I'd run up these stairs and show her you know, how, how tough I was or something. And I got to the top of the stairs, and I bent over, and I was like... <sighs> And I thought, what is wrong with me? Well, it's the altitude, right? So those of you that have gone to, to Denver know that when you go from sea level to 6,000 feet, um, it can knock you around. So we don't really want to go much higher than 6,000 feet, I'd say, because then you start needing oxygen. And, and you think this is going to be a house of prayer for all nations up there. So all people have got to be able to walk around freely all day long and not be worn out. So. I would have it if, if we had 4,000 feet and then another 1,000 feet for, the, for maybe just to beautify it and put it up there, way up there uh, above everything else, and then a little bit more for the altar, which is on the top of the mountain. You know, you're in that five to 6,000 feet zone, which, which is about right. You don't want to go any higher than that. All right, so the Middle East is going to be completely changed. And... Um, We've got, we've got verses about this. Now, the, Israel has never, ever had anywhere near this amount of land, but you have from the Euphrates down to the Nile, and then it talks from sea to sea. And uh, in Elpis Israel, Brother Thomas thought it went all the way to the Persian Gulf. So that area is 300,000 square miles, takes over a good portion of the Middle East today. And so all the people and all the fighting that we have, see on the news, uh, it's, sorry, guys, you need to pack your bags and... I've, Got a nice place down the road for you, but this is, this is holy land now. Unless you're a Jew, you're not welcome here. And then we, we split up the, the portions of the land, and God in his infinite wisdom splits it up into seven and five, so you have covenant and grace. He's always teaching us, isn't he? Always teaching us everywhere we look. And then in between those, you have the holy portion for the king. Now, I'll tell you a special thing before I forget. The children often want to know what happens to them if, if, uh, if the resurrection happens right now, well then what happens to us? Well, children are going to be taken care of, and there's this beautiful little passage in Ezekiel 47 where it talks about the children of the strangers, who I believe are the ch are Christadelphian children. And it says that they are so special that they get to pick which uh, canton of land that they want to live in. Now, if you're a Jew and you're of the tribe of Zebulun, then you have to live in the Zebulun portion of the land. You have to live there. You don't get a choice. But the children of the strangers get to choose where they want to live. So that's a huge privilege for the children and something to be grateful for. Um, I'm going to be real quick over this. So the, the law of Moses, which might seem boring if you're a young person, is actually really, really packed with wisdom. And so um, one of the things in the law is that these little Levite towns were scattered all around the place so that they were never far from the other towns. And that way, everybody would know the law and everybody would have somebody they could ask their tough questions to. Well, that's going to be us as saints when we 
go through and it says, well, thou good servant, because thou hast been faithful in a very little, have authority over 10 cities. And so you can imagine as a saint, you've got these little dwellings around you and everybody has to come back and forward to, to, uh, you, know, to you to learn and to bring their hard questions. So it's just beautiful the way it all sets out. Crossroads of the world, we mentioned that. And anybody that's looked at a globe sees that Israel is perfectly suited in between Europe and Asia and Africa. And that's why they were always getting steamrolled because every time a king of the north wanted to fight a king of the south, they marched through Israel's land and had their battle there. But uh, it's going to be not war, it's going to be peace that's going to be going through in all directions through that center of land. There's going to be a way of holiness highway. Right now we see that Israel's at war with uh, Gaza and Lebanon and perhaps uh, eventually Damascus and other places. Well, these quotes are nice. It talks about that in the kingdom that uh, Egypt and Syria are going to be good neighbors and they're actually going to set up pillars that say welcome to the Holy Land and they're going to welcome the travelers through there and it's going to be fantastic and they call it the way of holiness highway and it talks about Egypt setting up an altar and a pillar and it's it's just going to be fantastic all right um, moving along if any is, has anybody got Sully's book on the temple so yeah anybody that's had a look good look through Sully's book on the temple this comes up a lot so this is zooming in on the king's portion of the land and you have this square here that's 56 miles by 56 miles, all right? And if you come up later and look at the diorama that, that uh, I made, it's pretty much looking at that portion of the land. So on the northern part, you have is set aside for the sons of Zadok, which is the saints, and then the pink portion is for the Levites, and then down here is the possession of the city where Yahweh Shema, the big city, uh, for the travelers is going to be. And either side of it uh, is the king's land. And it, there's a verse that talks about that his best, or his, it doesn't say his favorites, but um, the head of the princes or something is what's used. So think Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the Apostle Paul, they're all going to get permanent dwelling places here in this section, right? The rest of us, we might get sent back here to Richmond or wherever. Um, to do our stuff, but we, we're all going to cycle through Zion to do work uh, as we're called upon, and there's precedent for that in the scriptures. So here's, um, here's the diorama, and you'll see this is Yahweh Shema, the holy temple up there, the Dead Sea that's now living, and uh, we've got a river going into the Dead Sea and another one going back out into the Med. And I'm just, uh, I am making some of this stuff up. We just don't know where the rivers are going to go. We do definitely know one's going to go into the, into the Dead Sea to make it alive again. But I just thought it would be pretty. Every good city needs a river running through it. So I, the other river I ran through, Yahweh Shema. All right, and there's the oblation laid over the top. All right, so the rivers, talk about this real quick. Um, we, we're getting towards the end of it. So in that day, the water shall go forth from Jerusalem, half to the former sea and half of them toward the hinder sea and summer and winter it will be. And he said to me, uh, so that's in Zechariah and the Ezekiel passage says, these waters issue out toward the east country, go down into the desert or plain and go into the sea, which being brought forth into the dead sea, the waters will be healed and it will come to pass that everything that liveth, which moveth, uh, whithersoever the two rivers shall come, shall live, and there shall be a very great multitude of fish, because the waters shall come thither. And so imagine that, imagine the Dead Sea full of fish, and people down there fishing um, all the time. And then it, it actually zooms in, it says from En Gedi to um, En Eglaim. Nobody really knows where En Eglaim is, that's why I got a question mark there. But as you can see, it's kind of in that touristy area. So I can imagine people going to Yahweh Shema, which is the city, and uh, when they have some free time, going and fishing in the living sea. So are they, is that for tourists? I'm not sure. I know that the Lord Jesus liked fishing, and I'd love to go fishing with him. Uh, and then the miry places there, we talked about them being elevated uh, 1,500 feet or 1,300 feet. Now... 
you think, oh, I can't go backwards. Hang on, I've got to back out of this somehow. Okay, so with regards to the salt down here, you say, well, why would, why would God save that? Well, we know in the Old Testament that that's, that's for the sacrifices. You have to put salt on the sacrifices. So God has put this here uh, for all time for it to be a mine for salt for the temple. So it's all there. It's all set up. He's thought everything through. It's, it's wonderful. Um, Yahweh Shema. So I was trying to come up with a city that had 12, a picture of something that had 12 sides, and it's kind of difficult to make it work within. And I thought, well, what would God do? And I, anyway, long story, I came up with this 12 sided snowflake. How pretty is that, right? And so Yahweh Shema has 12 gates for the 12 tribes of Israel. And perhaps it'll be laid out like this. And then in the middle, you have town hall and all roads lead there. And I'm just making that up. But it's fun to think about. How would you do it? Um, but this city is going to be amazing. And the name Yahweh Shema means to the Lord from here, or the Lord is there. And so if you imagine yourself in the city here, this is what you would see as you look north you would see the temple up on Zion there with the cloud and all the brilliance and beautiful stuff that we see in that cloud. And so everybody in the city says, to the, that's where the Lord is. That's where the Lord is. And it's going to be terrific. And I got to thinking about this just the other day. Yahweh Shema is 11 miles by 11 miles. The temple is one mile by one mile. So it's over 100 times bigger than the temple footprint. Why is it so big? If people are just going to come, stay the night, go to the temple, come back, decompress, and then leave, you don't need a city that big. So, again, I'm making this up, but to me, I also know that all nations have to go up there to learn about God. Now, how much can you learn if you spend one day at the temple? Not a whole lot. I mean, think of a, a gathering. You get two or three talks. How much information can you really get to take back home if you only have one day at the temple? So my speculation is that this city is a place, it's like a college city, and people from all over the world will go up there to learn, to study the things of God. And then when they graduate, they'll go to the temple, and it'll be like a big graduation thing to go to the temple, and then they'll go home and they'll tell everyone at home all the things they learn. It's got to be something like that, because we have to re-educate the whole world. Education alone, Sunday school for the world, will have the biggest effect in changing us from the kingdoms of man to the kingdom of God. And that's why, oh, look at this handsome young fella. Look at this, right? Here's Professor St. Joseph, uh, where the, the students will come up and learn from him for uh, three or four months until they graduate. Very, very dapper. All right, so there's 11 miles square over Richmond. As you can see, it's um, sort of halfway to the airport. You get a bit of a feel for that if you look at it for a few seconds. Um, here it is over New York, a little, little wonky, but same thing. So you've got the business district all the way up to the George Washington Bridge, a huge area. Uh, and this is for that city, Yahweh Shema. Over Jerusalem, a little bit harder to see there, but Jerusalem's just tiny inside that footprint. So what's Yahweh Shema going to look like? Nobody knows. Uh, this is me sort of beautifying it as best I can. I always go back to Naboo from Star Wars. Um, but it's got to be the most beautiful place. It really does. And one of the wonderful things about this is there's a, there's a passage. I can look it up for you later if you're interested. But it talks about, it's in the end of Ezekiel, it's 47 or 48, uh, where it talks about all the tribes of Israel will have to take their turns in coming down to this city and serving there. And so people from all the tribes will, you know, if you're a cook, if you're a singer, if you're, you know, whatever it is, a teacher, you'll come down to that city and rotate through there and it says to serve the nations. And so we have a, a, another wonderful thing happening here that God's designed so that... Um, 
the Jews need to kind of be humbled a little bit, right? And so they're going to go and serve the nations. And when the mortals from the nations go up there, they're going to have the Jews looking after them. And they're going to say, wow, these Jews aren't so bad. They're really nice people. They really looked after me on that trip. And so this love of the Jews is going to develop. And the humbleness of the Jews will happen when they interact with the nations. This is a house of prayer up in Zion for all nations. So uh, just another shot. Pinterest is really kind of fun right now. There's, with artificial intelligence, there's all these uh, fantasy worlds that, you can, that people come up with. And I wish I could find somebody that actually creates them because we could really do some fun stuff, some fun king, kingdom stuff. But just uh, absolutely beautiful. I look at these things, it's like, take me now, take me now. I want to go. All right, so just to recap, we looked at Solomon's kingdom being the template for Jesus' kingdom. So go read up on Solomon's kingdom and see what that would, what, what that would be like. Uh, a time of great peace and prosperity, we already know. Uh, there's lots of actual work to be done. You think of the, the rebuilding efforts that have got to happen after that earthquake and even the temple itself being a mile by a mile. Human creativity unleashed to glorify God. I really, really believe that. I think it's people will spend a decade building, a, a woodcarver might spend a decade building a, a staircase. It's, everything has to be just beautiful. Um, a new renaissance, big topographical changes, the division of the land, and uh, Yahweh Shema. So think about those things. If you've got any questions or any thoughts, I always want to hear what other people's ideas and visions of the kingdom are. But uh, that's a bit, of a, a bit of a basis, looking at it from a slightly different view than uh, we might have before. And I do think it's fun to use your imagination. We have a lot of information and sometimes you've got to fill in the gaps. And the clues are there, so we just got to go find, find the information and then we can start to build a picture in our own minds of what it is and how much better that is than anything this world can offer us. It really is.